One of your next assignments down the line involves you refactoring it, and it involves getting feedback from a couple of people. Um, so by Tuesday, Tuesday we're going to spend our class time doing that. Now, if you're not at the point where you are finished enough to do that, then you'll work, you can work with me or others to get to that point. So again, bring your code. We can put it on my machine if you don't have a laptop or whatever. Uh, or, you know, bring the code and we can look at it so that people can go and, and help you refactor it. So that'll be Tuesday of um, next week. Um, we probably have a quiz coming down the line somewhere. All right. Um, I, if I remember right, we have two quizzes and a final. And if you realize the quiz, the quiz, I aim... My quiz is my chance to be nice to everyone, all right? Uh, I didn't make the quiz too terribly challenging, and it's just sort of like, you know, just checking a couple concepts to make sure that they've stick, they, they've stuck, sticked, stuck, whatever the right word is. So um, I'll check the schedule, because this is week nine already. Next week is week 10. I, honest to God, it seems to me like we've just been meeting for a couple weeks. I mean, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but it is it has flown by. Um, so we have uh, probably a little more than a month, uh, six weeks, let's say, month and a half left. Yes. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot of Android stuff. Um. Why is there? Let me let me turn the question around. Is there something that you are particularly interested in? Okay. Yeah, those those are probably those are probably in the plans. In other words, um, having like a menu, having like um, options, settings, um, things like that, and having an app that uses multiple activities would be another one. All right. Essentially, where you say multiple windows, multiple screens, that's really a multiple activity. Because remember, each activity is like one thing you're pre 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 presenting to the user for them to do. So if you go to another screen and ask them to do something else, then that's another activity. So we'll go into multiple activities. We'll go into um, uh, the, the settings and, and the menus and all that. All right, if there are no questions, oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Right. Deprecated. Right. Sure. What am I Googling? Let's, let's search within this page for deprecated. Probably is on the view. Okay. Okay. Okay, here, uh, this is, I assume, the method get caller method has been deprecated. What can I do? <laughs> yeah.
that is um, All right, it looks like you could make a function to do this. And look at the version of the SDK being used. And if it's greater than 23, it uses the new one. Otherwise, it uses the old method. Now, that is... Um, uh-huh. Yeah, you probably need to import. Okay. Um, yes. Um, Okay. Yeah, th this one sounds better to take a look at rather than... You, you have it with you? Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, we can take a look at it after class because um, um, in general terms, when you say something is deprecated, typically it means that it still works, all right? But it's not like the latest and greatest method to do something, all right? So if it just was deprecated, it should still work. Now... If it's keeping you from compiling, obviously, it almost seems like it's more than deprecated. It was like removed from the API or whatever. So it might be the way that you're compiling it. You might be able to build it under an earlier version of the SDK, all right? Or it's something that we can change. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. That's one of the things that, I mean, it, it makes this class never boring, right? Because nothing stands still, right? I mean, by the time a textbook is printed, you know, probably 10 things have already changed. And, and it, it's kind of difficult. And, you know, the, the good news or the bad news is, is that, you know, even with this round of stuff, it's not going to stop changing. So what we can hope to do is teach you some basics about the framework that, by and large, will remain staying true, all right, and then teach you troubleshooting skills and, 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 and uh, critical thinking skills to be able to, to track down uh, the problems that you have. So in a way, I mean, these kind of things, and, and I can say this because I'm a teacher and I don't have to do it, I just have to grade the stuff that you do, all right. In a way, some of these things, uh, problems you run into are great because these are the kind of problems that you run into exactly in the real world, and when you leave us, even if you did everything perfectly by the SDK that you're working on, the next SDK that runs, uh, rolls out will have its own set of, of issues. I wonder what they're going to do when they get to Z, by the way, because they all start with a different letter. It's marshmallow now, right? What, you know, wonder what they do. Start over? Yeah, probably. I do not remember, uh, I, I don't remember all the names. I mean, I remember Jelly Bean and... Yeah. Yeah, right, they might, they might have only named it at a certain point. All right, tic-tac-toe. Now, where we left off with that was... with the idea that, here's our screen, and if we play,
I have to look at the difficulty because I should be winning more. I know I have it on hard. But I mean the computer should be winning more. Yeah. But I'm making the dumb move that I'm playing O and it should be able to beat me. Yes, I'm intentionally making a dumb move. Because it should, there, there you go. There you go. Now I can't block it either here or here. If I block it here, it will go there and win. All right. So I don't know why it doesn't do that on the, on, unless I still have some randomness even at the, at the most difficult level. That's a possibility. Anyhow, we'll take a look. Um, the key thing from last time was this. There was two key points from last time. One of them was that we have a two-dimensional array, a three-by-three three array of image views that correspond to the image views on the screen. So, our screen has the tic-tac-toe grid on it. Each of these is an image view. No inflating or anything like that is necessary because tic-tac-toe is only a 3x3 three three grid. We then have in our code an array of IVs, and it doesn't even have to be an array list, it's just an array, that is a 3x3 three three array, where element is 0, 0, points to this element. And I'll just do a few of them randomly. IV 1, 1 points to that element, and so on down the line. All right. So we have it in an array because then it'll be easier for us to do processing with it. It's straightforward code for us to look and see if everything in a row is, is done. It's also straightforward code to see if everything in a column is done. Whereas if we had them as nine separate image views that weren't in an array, that would be harder for us to, to, to code. All right. So essentially, we did the same thing that we did when we say get element by, uh, or get a view by ID. Right? Essentially, we did the same thing. The only difference is, is by convention, the IDs of these things are cell 0, 0, cell 0, 1, cell, 0, 2, and so on. And we take and we dynamically create that name and get a pointer to it. So let's take a look at that section of the code. I am not sure. Yeah. Um, I am not sure what they do to set that up this way or that way. I don't think it really affects what I'm doing. Um, I just have to make sure I have the right screen on because if I have it like this, the video recording is going to record the, the Elmo guy and um, I'll be talking about code that you'll be able to see but people in the video won't be able to see. All right. So let's go and let's, just to remember this, let's go and pull up the main XML. All right. Each cell, again, is using that naming convention of cell, the row that it's in, and the column that it is. So that's cell 0, 0. This is cell 0, 1, cell 0, 2, and so on. So our activity
our activity, one of the things that we do when we initialize this is we loop through and populate our array. And we dynamically generate the resource ID because we don't want to hard code cell 01, cell 00, cell 01, cell 02. So we just put that in a loop that goes in and puts in each of those array elements the cell whose name is cell i plus j. And i and j are both for loops, so they both go from 0 to 3. The outer loop is for each row. The inner loop is for each column. And so it populates it that way. So when we're done, iv sub ij corresponds to the thing on Uh, the array corresponds to a grid of the 3 by 3 um, cells. We set the on click listener of each one to this. All right, what is this? Well, this is this activity, this object that I'm on. And we do the same thing with the seek bar. The seek bar has a difficulty level that we default to 50, and then um, we can adjust it. All right. So this class itself is both the on click listener and the on seek bar listener. Um, one thing potentially could do is, is again, we had a little bit of discussion of this after classes. You can make a class for each of those. Really doesn't matter. It is largely a case of what you think is clear. If we change the seek bar. All we do is we take the value of the seek bar and set our skill level to whatever the value of the seek bar is. The seek bar returns a 0 to 100, depending on where um, it is. Then I put toast in. And toast is a way of popping up uh, a little message that simply tells you something was, was done. It's good for messages that you don't necessarily want to um, spend a lot of time designing a window for or something like that. If, if it's just like confirming that something has been deleted that the user tried to delete or whatever. In this case, and it's also valuable for debugging, in this case I have the toast pop up when I go and change the skill level. A little message that pops up saying what the new skill level is. So I can test the code that way. Question? Well, it's built in. Um, and it is a method that exists on the activity class. Because that's what my guy is, it's an activity. All right, let's look next at the on click aspect of this. We also clear board, which clear board looks through and simply initializes everything back to the starting point. We have a variable for what move it is. That is important in the code for the computer making the move because the computer looks to see what move number it is and decides what to do in part based on the move number. Um, this wipes it out and then we have a whose turn it is, X or O. X being the computer, O being the, the person. Now, we talked a little bit about why I don't have an array of the value of that image list. In other words, whether it's an X or no. I just have an image view. I'm actually stuffing in a attribute of an image view called tag. I'm stuffing in the ID of the X or the O. All right? And I initialize it to none. All right? And the none is the little question mark uh, um, image. So I initialize the image and the tag for the image as being um, the none image, the ID of the none image. All right. That's just going to make my life easier when I go back later and try to decide if a particular space is an X or an O. All right. Because then instead of looking at the image, I'll look at the tag. And the tag and the image go together. So if I look at the tag, that's the same thing as looking at the image. Same thing as looking to see if an X or an O is there. So that's just an additional attribute associated with the 
<laughs> sorry, there's someone like peeking in on that. Just kind of funny. I'm sorry. Easily distracted here. But by... I sure hope not. With that music, yeah. Oh, <laughs> good Lord. All right. I don't know why we have this music going. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah, we've been to this disconnect to the other campus, but I don't want to hear. see if I can do something with the volume. All right, but I'm not sure it will pick up my microphone now. Over where? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I, I think this class that originally was going to be offered in Ridgeville, so I think they connect to it every, every time, and therefore they got disconnected because the guy poked his head in and I don't know, whatever. At any rate, this we're going to use to keep track of who is, uh, what, what the state of the um, cell is. Okay. So, let's look at the After we clear the game, it's the computer's move. So that's going to execute this. So we increment the move number. The move number was 0, so we increment it. So now we're at move 1. Move 1, the computer is always going to play that center cell, right? Because that is the right choice. It doesn't matter what the difficulty is set on, all right? doesn't matter what the difficulty is set on. Yes? Yeah, that's okay to disconnect, but I just don't want to hear the elevator music. Okay, thank you. All right. Bye. All right. First move the computer makes is always going to be to pick the center square. All right. Always, always, always. I don't even look at the difficulty level on that. All right. At the very bottom, the computer always goes first. Yeah. Sue me. 
I didn't make it right before class one day. I, I sort of dashed it out quickly. I found it before class because I was looking for an example. All right. Then after I'm done, I evaluate the board. Evaluate the board. We'll look at it in a minute here. But essentially, it looks to see if anyone has won yet. All right. So evaluate the board is up here. All right. And I set a winner to a string that no one wins. And then I look to see if it's a winner or not. We'll go over this code in more detail in a bit because I want to go through the clicking first. And once we go through the clicking, we'll look at the evaluate board. The bottom line is that at the end of the method, See where it does it, but oh, um, I keep track of whose turn it is. If it's X's turn, I call the computer move. If it's not X's turn, oh, make move. Make move flips whose turn it is. I have it set to 1 or negative 1. That way I can just multiply it by negative 1 to flip it from between 1 and negative 1. All right. Let's look at the click, and let's look at what happens when you click on something. On click, if whose turn equals O, Right. That means that I can't go while it is the computer's turn. Exactly. So, if, it's a, if the computer is thinking about it temporarily, which would be pretty unlikely for me to be able to click that fast, but if it's a computer's turn, I can't sneak in and click two at the same time. All right? So, if it's not the computer's turn, I thought that was a zero at first, but that's the letter O, meaning it's O's turn. Then I make move and I call it with an image view. All right. What image view am I calling it with? The one that was clicked. Now this gets to be confusing. Remember we have saw all along, we've seen in our onClick listener that the onClick method has an argument. All right. We've seen this since day one. We just probably never used it before. What is that argument? That's the thing that actually got clicked. So the onClick view uh, method gets called and gets past the image view that actually got clicked. All right. So I'm calling make move and I'm giving it the image view that got clicked. All right. So that way, if it's my turn, and I click that one, I pass to the make move that image view. All right? So, make move accepts an image view. What do I do? Well, I grab the tag of that image view. What's the tag? All right? Well, Remember we said that in addition to the image, the image view has another at attribute, the tag. All right? And that tag represents the current state of it. So what I'm doing here is I'm checking to see if that tag corresponds to R drawable none. What is R drawable none? It's the question mark. Right? It means that no one has selected it yet. The image view can be one of three things. It can be none, it can be the X, or it can be the O. All right? So, if it's already selected, then clicking on it does no good. So, if I'm here and I click on this, it doesn't change it to an O. All right? 
So if I click that and I click on any of these, it doesn't use up my turn. Why is that? Because these five spaces, or these six spaces, are the ones whose drawable is still none. The drawable is the question mark. The other uh, three spaces, the, the two that are X's and the one that are O's, have a different drawable. So this simply ensures that I cannot click on the same thing twice. All right? And if that image you got clicked on, all right, and it was allowed to be clicked on by virtue of the fact that it did not already have a choice in there, then if it's X's turn, I set the image and tag to X. If it's, if it's O's turn, I set the um, image and tag to O. All right? Because I'm using the same method, make move, when the computer makes it and when the player makes it. All right. Now let's think about that for a second. Because again, keep in mind that the purpose of this class isn't to d d design a tic-tac-toe game. The purpose of this is to learn Android programming, Java programming, programming. Okay? So, I've talked before about the fact that we want to make our event listeners thin. We don't want to put a lot of code in our event listener. Why not? Because that code we might do in a couple different places. All right? So, the code make move gets called from two places. It gets called when I click on one of the image views, and when it's the person's turn and I click on the image view, it gets called the onClick method. Why? Because it's the onClick listener. And what does it do? It calls the make move method and passes the image that the player has clicked on. But the other place where that make move method gets called is within the computer moves logic. We've already seen an example of that. In the case of move one, I call it make move and I pass it the center image view. All right. So this make move method gets called both when the computer makes a move and when I make a move. So the bigger point here, if this logic were embedded in the on click event, I could only call that logic when they clicked on the button or when they clicked on the image. And I really want to call it from either of the two places. Because making a move for the computer is the same thing as making a move for uh, a person, right? Same rules apply. Computer can't change a square that's already been changed. Um, after I make the move, um, I want to switch uh, the person's turn. So if it was the computer that made the turn, now it's going to be the player's turn. If it's the player's turn, now it's going to be the computer's turn. And depending on if it's an X or an O, I set that image view to either show the X or show the O. And then in addition, we set the tag to either be X or O. So, that's one important thing of this. The fact how I wrote a method and I call that method from two places. And I can do that by keeping my event listener thin. Alright? So, if I click on a cell, alright, What, does, what is the purpose of this? If make move and that actually returns a true or false, right? Make move returns a true or false. When would make move return a false? No. When it's not your turn, it's handled by this if statement. If you've clicked it and it's already been changed. In other words, if the O tried to click on an X spot or another O spot, this method would return a false, and therefore it doesn't 
go and evaluate the board. Effectively, you have not changed, you have not made your move yet if you've picked a move that's not legal. All right. And in fact, I don't change whose move it is if they have not made a valid move. It will stay the player's move. So let's look at the evaluate board now. All right. The evaluate board goes and looks to see if someone has won. First thing it does is it looks to see if there's any free cells. All right. That's important for what reason in tic-tac-toe? Yeah. Why do I want to know that when I'm evaluating the board? Okay. And when I'm evaluating the board to see who won or lost, why do I care if there's any open spaces? To see if it's a draw. Exactly. So, I check first of all to see if there's any free spaces or not. Because if I make it through the end of this, if someone won, if the X won or the O won, fine. X won or O won. If neither X or O won and there's no free spaces left, then it's a draw. So, I'm going to need to know at the bottom of the function whether there's any free spaces yet. So, I have a couple of loops. This loop looks effectively to see if a column is all the same. All right? And I could refactor this, probably. Oh, no, no, no. I stand corrected. This looks for diagonals. All right, the diagonals is the oddball one, right? So I'm looking to see if, if 0, 0 and, no, that's straight up and down, right, my, my mistake. This is looking, yeah, this is looking to see straight up and down. Is column 1 all X's or is column 1 all O's? Is column... 2 all X's or column 2 all O's. Finally, is column 3 all X's or column 3 all O's. This one does each row. Is row 1 all X's? Is row 1 all O's? Is row 2 all X's or row 2 all O's? And then finally, no, I, I, I actually... I got that reverse. This one looks at the rows. This one looks at the columns. And again, how do I do that? What is a row? Well, a row is everything that has the same value for the first subscript. All right, in my array. So, the first row is IV0, IV01, and IV02. So, all three where the first number is zero constitutes the first row. And because I loop through it three times, I loop through and look at the, the first row, the second row, and the third row. The same thing works for the columns. And I look to see if any of the columns are selected. Here is where I look at the diagonals. There's two diagonals I need to check. The diagonal going slanting down and the diagonal slanting up. I look to see if the diagonal slanting down are all X's. Is the diagonal slanting down all O's? Is the diagonal slanting up all X's? Is the diagonal slanting up all O's? So, these are the scenarios that determine whether or not there's a winner or not. Alright? This is where some comments would be 
helpful. All right? All right? Well, you know what? And this is where, this is where it's, 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 you know, they say it's good to be king, right? And not being teacher is the same as being king. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have those kind of delusions of grandeur. But I could always make the argument that it would be a good exercise for you to go in and comment these, to go in and look and say, because that will tell you if you understand what it's doing. Yes? Yes. 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 Or you have comments that are next to useless. You'll have... You have this. Set X to zero. It's like, yeah, that's a comment. All right, that's a comment, and that is what that statement does, but it's, it's meaningless. So, like, what is X? Now, if you, you know, a better comment would be like, initialize students total tuition to zero cuz that tells you that tells you why you are setting it to zero not it doesn't simply explain the syntax of it and what x is right yeah right 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 yeah, but like you're absolutely right. Here's, here's the thing: good coders are lazy. Some good coders are lazy. The sociology of the sociology and economics of comments in software. That is as a special topics course that, that we're going to Yeah, we're going to we're gonna have. But yeah, it's my experience that comments are a very mixed bag. Um, that is not my strong point. I will be honest with you. All right. No. I said, I wrote this. I found this when I was looking for an example. I was looking through my list of examples of things oh. I could be doing, and, and uh, I, I found this. Bottom line is, I would very rarely comment to simply explain what the syntax means. The assumption is, is that if you made it this far, you understand the syntax. Unless it was some real tricky kind of syntax. You know, I mean, there, there's always cases of like some obscure function in some language that no one in the world knows, so you comment that. But effectively, in a nutshell, here's what I'm doing. If I were to comment this, see if any free cells useful for determining tie. See if either X or O has a complete row. See if either X or O has complete column. See if X has diagonal 1, and so on down the line. See, already I'm getting bored. <laughs> All right. Now, if the winner
if the winner is not no one wins or there's none free so what will the English language of this be if either there is a winner or no more free cells remain right the vertical pipes indicates an or all right so this indicates an or so that's two conditions so I'm looking to see if someone has won all right winner is simply a, a, a string all right that keeps track of you know who won and I have a no one won string and I have an X one string and I have a O one string and I set that string to the appropriate string if one of them is one so this test sort of the end of game condition because when is the game over the game is over if someone wins or there's no more cells left so if someone is one that is it is not that no one has won. <laughs> See, this is where comments are handy, right? Um, or no more free cells remain, then I'm going to display who won. All right? And here's a little alert dialog that simply pops up. Pardon me? You know the funny thing is, that's probably copied like from a Dito example. <laughs> all right. So, all right. If I'm fit, this is up there. I did post it like either last night or today. So if you want to look at it. All right. So if you're done and click OK, then you clear board and you start another game. Otherwise, if this if statement is false, it means that the game is still on. And if it's the computer's turn, make the computer turn. Now, making the computer turn I have broken down into depending on what turn it is. And since there's only five possible turns, I can do it exhaustively. All right? First turn I have hard coded. I always pick the center. If you don't pick the center, that's not smart. So even on the easiest difficulty, I do that. I then, for each of the moves, have a little function that looks like this. that says, if math random times 100 is less than skill, then I'm going to make the optimal move. And here's the code to determine the optimal move. Oops. So I determine what row and column I want to pick, and then I make the move. Otherwise, I make the random move. So again, if my difficulty is set to 0, in other words, it's on the simplest setting, then pretty much whatever they generate as a random number is going to be greater than the skill level. All right? Therefore, I'm not going to make the optimal move. I'm going to make the random move. In each of these, I have the random move as a possibility. And what does a random move do? It simply goes and tries a move until it finds a legal move. All right? So it tries a move over and over again until it finds a cell that hasn't been picked. All right? So I generate a random number, and I generate a random i and j, and I try to make that move. All right? If that move works, then that's true and I'm done with the loop. If that space has already been taken, then I loop through again. And I do this over and over again until 
certainly without too much time, I'm going to hit one of the cells that's available, if there is an available cell. All right. So make random move does that. And I do that at the end of the game. Because really, at the end of the game, the last move, you got to take the last space that's available, right? You don't have any choice. And I could have wrote a method that looked for what space was available and picked that, but I figure the make random move is going to hit it pretty, pretty quickly. Yes? It'll make one iteration, yes. Yes, it'll make at least one iteration. So it will do this, it'll try to make at least one move, and if it succeeds, then it's done. If it doesn't succeed, then it will repeat until it does succeed. Now, where I put most of my work, and where almost certainly the mistake is, is in move number two. Because move number two is where the action happens. Because essentially, here are the two possibilities. If I play an X in the center, they can either play here or they can play here. Any other move is just that rotated, <laughs> all right? So if they pick that corner, that's really the same as that corner. This is the same as that. So either they pick one of the corners or they pick a non-corner. If they pick this, I should win every time, which I don't, which is where the bug is in. All right, there's a bug somewhere in my code if I don't win every time. That is on the highest difficulty level. If I pick this, I should at least draw. All right. So, here's my logic for doing this. And again, what I'm doing is I'm looking to see where they have made their pick. And I'm coming up with a I and J to make my move. Now, if they've moved here, I should move alongside of it. So I could either move here or here. So if they've picked this one, I should put my X right next to that. If I put it here, then it really doesn't matter. Where I put it, it should lead to a draw, provided I don't make a mistake. Now, this is a code that there's a bug in. Because if it's on the highest difficulty level, I should never lose. So I'll look at that and I'll try to change it. But the bottom line is what I'm doing here, without going into the detail of every line of code, is I'm trying to see where they put their O. And based on where they put their O, I decide where to put my X. And then I make my move. Go back to this loop. All right. What this is looking is this is looking for the position where the O is. Remember, this is move number two, so there's one O out there. I'm looking for the position that the O is. Well, that would do it. Okay. All right. Now, move three and four are uh, 
pretty straightforward, I think. And maybe there needs to be more logic here as well. I'll have to think about that. But I will either, if I'm in optimal playing mood and I am making the optimal choice, I will look to see, I will make either a winning or a blocking move. So that's what move three or four is meant to be. All right. I'm going to try to either play a block or I'm going to try to play a win. All right. What does win or block do? Well, it loops through and it looks for, it uses the evaluate possibility method to look to see if I make a move can I win? So it's evaluating if I make a move can I win? So essentially, it's looking for places where there's two in a row and an empty cell. So that's what this logic does. Okay. The details of this, and we can spend some time on this. I, 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 I'm curious why it is not playing the right move all the time. Um, it might be, as I think about it, it might be the, I don't know, I'll have to, I'll have to look. But, um, pardon me? Where's that? Yeah, that that's a possibility. You mean like where I'm doing the random? Yeah, I don't know. I'll take a look at the logic of this, all right? What are the things I wanted to demonstrate from this, all right? Um, again, it's not about writing the algorithm for tic-tac-toe. It's about creating an array for these things so that I could refer to them in a systematic way, all right? It's much easier to refer to things and look for patterns in things if it's in an array than if it's simply random variables. So think about it. If you were to do a word search puzzle or something like that, all right, you would not want, if you're doing a 10 by 10 word search puzzle, to have 100 different variables. Right? You would want a 10 by 10 array and then have each one of those point to something on the screen or point to something in, in the UI or whatever. So creating an array that each corresponds to an element of the UI is something that allows me to more systematically evaluate the things. The other thing is the use of um, almost nothing in the listeners. Notice both of these listeners have almost no code in them. All right. They simply, in one case I simply set the difficulty level, and in the other case I call the make move function. The big advantage of that, of course, is then I can call that make move function from elsewhere. All right, questions about this. It is up there. Take a look at it. Go through and comment it if you want. Remember, Tuesday we are going to, um, I, I will either give you assistance on your um, blackjack game or you can do peer reviews. Uh, people can look at your code and, and make comments uh, on that. All right, that's all I had for today.